taller proportional mass. The only formula we have for mast height is that it should equal the girth of the ship. The advantage of this formula is that it increases that is that increases in length without increases in beam give you a geo, uh, a arithmetical increase instead of a geometrical increase. In other words, if it's twice as long but the same beam, the mast isn't going to get any higher, but you can make your yard longer. So as you pick up extra beam, which gives you extra stability, then your mast can get taller. But if it's just length, you get more sail area, but you don't get huge gobs of sail area. You please reference the law of mechanical similitude, uh, which is a whole thing on the stability. This, this is the, the fallacy of building scale models of Viking ships and then putting people on them. Or in the case of the War of 1812, they built a replica of the Barney Barge, which was four-fifths size, and then they went around looking for four-fifths size <laughs> people. It didn't work very well. But there have been a number of replica Viking ships that are like two-thirds size of, of Dockstad ships. And once again, you have to modify everything because you can't get two-thirds size people. And they're not as stable. Uh, later depictions of medieval ships, mostly in the post-Viking period, show variations of a crutch-like device which could be used to cradle a lowered mass. But in all of our years of sailing these vessels, with the exceptions of low bridges and haul-outs, none of us has ever observed the need to lower the mast. So here we have the Bayou, the Bayou comic strip, as we like to think of it. And notice now, we, we know the people aren't that big, but, but notice a consistency on general proportions. If you drop that mast, it's going to drop way astern, okay? All of these. If you go to the Gotland picture stones, you end up with much the same thing. Look, look at the height of the mast, okay? People are exaggerating the height of the mast, but when you're on board, the mast doesn't look that high. Once again, okay, if you arc the mast back, that mast appears to be well taller. Okay, if it was going to fit in here, it would be this tall. Uh, proportions change because of the artist's viewpoint, but they don't change that much. And throughout this whole thing, oops, where's the mess? Oh my god, look, they're probably under oars rowing, and they dropped, the, no, no, um, you, you see that little line there? Okay, and, and see those gangplanks there? They're all coming ashore. They've all reached where they're going. They're going to be hauling those ships up onto the beach and securing them. Reality and artistic depictions have a rocky relationship. That's because reality is somewhat fuzzy. When somebody fits a representation of a ship onto the artistic confines of a coin, you expect some distortion. For instance, here is a coin with a ship's small sail. Okay, uh, I skipped the part here. Coming ashore, Bayou Tapestry, William comes ashore. It shows him lowering the masts. Okay? William's making a statement. The Bayou Tapestry is making a statement. This isn't a smash and grab. We're coming to stay. We're bringing our ships, coming up on shore, dropping the mast, because we're not running. We burned our bridges behind us. Like Cortez, burning his ships. I don't agree with Cortez. William Sparner, you can always get the mast back up. All right, back to where I was. Coins. Okay. So, reality and artistic depictions. Here's a coin, shows a curled sail. And notice uh, the nice sort of lumpy part of our sail. Uh, what we do as standard practice, and we don't know if this is Viking Age, this just works for us, 
is, is we essentially crochet the sails. We take the sheets, the long stringy things that you control the bottom of the sail with, and we take it and we take a bite and we feed another bite through that and we feed another bite through that and another bite so that both ends you start curling up the sail tight against the yard. It works great because when you hoist the sail, you untie the last knot, yank on them, and it all falls out and the sail falls down. Hopefully as the yard goes up. No guarantees. Okay, this is interesting. All right, here's, here's a depiction on a coin. See the small sail there? Okay. High up the mast, relatively small sail. And this is our small sail that we've got. Uh, the ship in the background is the, uh, which ship is that? Ignore the ship in the background. We're just chasing it. Okay, so you, you've got your small sail up the mast. Then the Bayou Tapestry, you have those odd-shaped sails. Okay, here's our Bayou-style sail. And here we are with our, whoops, sorry, wrong way. I finally did it. Here we are with our large sail. Okay, so, pop quiz. How many sails do we have? Okay, all right. We have one sail. This is the same flipping sail. Three different pictures. But notice, I, I, to this day, I can't believe that this sail is the same as that sail. <laughs> These are photographs. It shouldn't be that much variation. But it's all a matter of how we had the sail trimmed and the angle that the picture was taken from. And on the coin, you know, it's the artist's eye. Does it look right? The artist had seen lots of these. This is how you got around in the Viking Age. So once again, just because the artist draws it that way doesn't mean it's that way, but you have to think it might be that way. Yes, sir? The, I don't know all the right terminology for this, but the, the bottom edge of the sail Right, the foot. The distance between that and the, the top fork? Uh, the yard. No, 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 the, oh, the, okay. top of the, the top of the hull. Oh, okay. Seems yes. right, like, it seems twice the height of the people. Seems very large to me. Well, a lot of these people are actually standing on forks, too. Yeah, okay, so why why such a huge amount rather than having to sail closer to the, the, the hull? Like, there. Even there, even there. Okay. Right? Um, part of it is because that's how high the shipwright made the mast. Okay. But part of it, and in Denmark they practice things differently. I'll address that in a little bit. Okay. But in Denmark they tend to have the sails all the way down. Yeah. You can't see where you're going. Oh, okay. 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 So, and, and, and if the weather picks up, we'll ease the sail down a bit. Okay. All right. So we, we have some we have some portions for reef points in there. But even before you take a reef, if you ease the sail down, it takes some of the pressure off because you're getting your most force near the top. Who's not from here back to face with those things? No. Oh, I know. I don't know that. But. Besides which, you know, if we're going to hang them from the yard arm, we might as well give them a good view of it. Ballast. This is the snoring. That's the one in the boat shop up in uh, Lonsaw Meadow in the Norstead settlement um, up in Newfoundland. The problem with living heritage is that it's alive. It continues to evolve. In the 19th and early 20th century, and I'm sure further back, Scandinavians would ballast their boats with nice, large, round stones. The fishing boats would often use their open holds. They put the ballast in there. As you caught more fish, they threw rocks out. If you capsized, then, God's willing, the rocks would roll out and the boat would continue to float. However, several hundred years of technological progress had taken place since the Viking Age. They had taller, much more efficient rigs. Smaller vessels had gone from square sails to fore and aft rigs. 
including sprit sails, sliding gunters, all the things. You know, it's, we're not just talking Bermuda. There's a number of fore and after rigs being used. But in Scandinavia today, when they build a replica, they seem to want to fill it full of rocks for ballast because that's the way we've always done it. I would contend on Viking Age vessels, especially warships, the crews provided both power and adjustable, obedient ballast. Give me 10 crewmen, and I can throw 1,500 to 1,800 pounds, or 680 to 816 kilos, a ballast on the windward rail. And if we switch tap, I can send them to the other rail. It's wonderful. I'm frequently drunk with power. <laughs> Behold the story, Harding Carter's replica Nar. She was full of boulders from Greenland when she came over. Some were the size of your head. Some were bigger. Captain Carter and his crew spent two summers trying to row a bunch of rocks from Greenland to Newfoundland. <laughs> now in this case, if you don't have cargo, you have rocks. But rocks don't row. You can't sell rocks, mostly, <laughs> when you get wherever the heck you're going. So far, we have avoided putting rocks in any of our vessels, and they 